Most airplanes have three different instrument systems. The first one is your pitot-static system that feeds your altimeter, your vertical speed indicator, and airspeed indicator. Then you have your gyroscopic system, which feeds the attitude indicator, the heading indicator, and the turn coordinator, which in most cases is electrical, and that's why it's not shown in this diagram. And finally, you have your compass. Let's start off with the pitot-static system. This system feeds three instruments, your altimeter, your airspeed indicator, and the vertical speed indicator. Note that there's a test question that says that the regulations require you to inspect the pitot-static system as well as the altimeter every 24 calendar months. While your static vents provide pressure readings for all three instruments, the pitot tube only provides readings for the airspeed indicator because the airspeed indicator is the only one that requires impact air to calculate your speed. As per the test questions that regard this area here, where they talk about cloggage of uh, either the pitot tube or the vents, and they ask you what instruments would be affected. Well, if the pitot tube becomes blocked, that one's only connected to the airspeed indicator, so only the airspeed indicator would be affected and become inoperative. While if the static vents become blocked, well, that's the static vents, as you see, are connected to all three instruments, meaning all three instruments will become inoperative. The altimeter, if you want, works on the same principle as a barometer. It compares a known uh, pressure to outside pressure. The way it does this is it has aneroid wafers inside it that are set to a certain pressure that we set through the Coleman's window. And by being connected to the outside uh, static vent, it actually can see what the pressure is outside comparing it to the pressure inside. And these aneroid wafers will expand or contract based on high and low pressures and indicate on your needles on the front of the instrument. The standard pressure at sea level is 29.92 inches of mercury, and the pressure will decrease about one inch per each thousand feet you increase in altitude. The indicated altitude will change as you climb because lower pressure will expand these aneroid wafers, giving you a reading in the front of the instrument. Reading altimeters is pretty simple. You always start from the 10,000 foot marker. In this case, that's the shortest line here. And after that, you will go to your 1,000 foot marker. And that's the fatter one, as shown in the figure again. And then you will go down to the 100 foot marker. Note that uh, they're in 20 foot increments. So for example, if I had to read this image, I can see that the 10,000 foot marker is just below 10,000 feet. The 1,000 foot marker is showing about 9,000 feet, while the 100 foot marker is showing right on 500. So if I add them all up, okay, the 10,000 says I'm just below 10,000, which is confirmed by the 1,000 foot marker, which is at 9,000 and looks like between 9 and 10, so 9,000, and then I look at the 100 foot marker and I see 500, and I have a total of 9,500 feet. Okay, let's go ahead and test your knowledge. Let's see if you can click on the altimeter that is displaying 10,500 feet. Setting the altimeter is pretty simple and straightforward. Most altimeters today are pressure sensitive, so they will have this Coleman's window somewhere on the instrument, and there's a knob on the bottom left of the instrument that will allow you to adjust the pressure. If at your airport there's a control tower, then there's probably ATIS, so you're able to get from ATIS the altimeter setting, put that inside your Coleman's window, and see if the altitude matches what your airport altitude should be. If you're not able to get any ATIS or any number to put in there, what you should do is adjust it to your airport's elevation. So you see that the airport elevation is about 600 feet. Well, just twist the knob until you have 600 feet displayed on the altimeter. Eventually, when you go and uh, fly around, ATC will give you an altimeter setting if you decide to contact ATC, and it's usually the first thing out of their mouth. Also, below 18,000 feet, every airplane is given an altimeter setting by ATC and flies according to whatever altimeter setting there is and is given. Above 18,000 feet, everybody flies pressure altitude. What that means is everybody that flies above 18,000 feet will put 2992 in the Coleman's window, and that's called pressure altitude. How does an altimeter work? We're pretty much talking about effects of non-standard pressure and effects of non-standard temperature, okay? So what would happen if you know, you're thrown in an area of cold weather, or if it's the, the pressure drops? Does the altimeter get affected? It does. How does it do it? Let's play with this little exercise. You have a house in Florida, 
you also have a house in the mountains. I am going to blindfold you and bring you to one of these two locations. The only way that you can tell me where you are is by using your other senses. In this case, you're going to see how well you can breathe or what the temperature is. And the temperature is really, really cold and the air is really thin. Either or, doesn't matter. But in general, let's say that the temperature is really, really cold. Your answer would be, you would tell me you brought me to my house in the mountains. And I could tell you, sorry, but I just tricked you. It's Florida and it's a very cold day. You know? Okay, so you thought you were in the mountains, but we we're actually in Florida, and it's a very cold day. The altimeter works the exact same way. Like your body is fooled, as the higher you go, the colder the temperature. That's what your body believes, that's what you know as a fact of life. Altimeter, same way. If you throw an altimeter in an area of very cold weather, it will read higher. It will think it has climbed. Same if the air gets thin. If you go up in the mountains and try to play a match of the football, hey, I, I can assure you, that even if you are an experienced football player, you're not going to be able to play for as long because the air is thin. So the altimeter, same situation. It works just like your body. So if you see one of those questions that says, how would the altimeter read if you go into an area of warmer air? Take out the altimeter and put yourself in with my little example. Remember the house in Florida and the house in the mountains. If the air is all of a sudden warm, you believe I brought you to Florida. You believe I brought you at a low altitude, right? Because in Florida it's flat and it's warm. Okay, so warm air makes you believe that you're closer to Earth. Now, take out you and put the altimeter. How would the altimeter read if the temperature becomes warmer? It thinks it went closer to Earth, so it will read lower. It is that simple. Now tap on the various images to find out some interesting facts. Oh, did we just go up into the mountains because it got so cold all of a sudden? Oh, right, the altimeter does the same. If we end up in, a, in an area of cold weather, the altimeter believes that we've climbed because that's where colder temperatures usually are. So your altimeter would lead higher. Hmm, it got kind of warm. Well, maybe for that picture a little bit too warm for my style. But still, where is it usually warmer? Well, the closer you get to Earth, the warmer it is, right? The temperature decreases 2 degrees per thousand feet. So if you're close to Earth, it's warm. If you're high up, it's cold. Your altimeter works the same way. If you enter all of a sudden an area of warm weather, the altimeter believes it's gone closer to Earth because that's the, the, the source of the heat. So anytime you get into a warm area, your altimeter reads lower than it should. Hmm, I could run for hours here, because we've got very high pressure, so the concentration of oxygen per particle is very high. Uh-oh, wouldn't the altimeter have the same problem? High pressure is located closer to the ground, so if all of a sudden we enter an area of high pressure, the altimeter would believe that we've gone closer to Earth because that's where pressure is usually higher. So your altimeter will read a lower altitude than it should. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. What's happening? Well, as you climb in altitude, the pressure decreases. Pressure decreasing means there's less dense oxygen that you are breathing making it harder for you to exercise, to play sports, or whatnot. That's because you're at a high altitude, and the pressure has decreased. You know that the pressure decreases one inch per thousand feet. So what would happen to the altimeter if we all of a sudden throw it in an area of very low pressure? Well, the altimeter thinks, okay, the pressure is decreased. When would the pressure normally decrease? The pressure would decrease if my pilot brought me to a higher altitude. So obviously the altimeter believes that you have climbed. You've gone to a higher altitude because that's where the pressure is normally lower. So in simple words, the altimeter reads higher. When you are really flying at a lower altitude, maybe you're flying at 5,000 feet, the pressure dropped 2 inches, the altimeter believes it's at 7,000 feet, reading 7,000 feet, 2,000 feet error up. Now let's go over some of the test questions. Remember, as I said at the beginning, you really need to pay attention to the question. You need to make sure that you understand exactly what they are asking you. Some of the toughest questions in this chapter are going to be really tricky. So again, let's give an example. 
Let's say they ask you how do variations in temperature affect the altimeter and they give you these three answers. What I do in this case here is I switch the indicated altitude with myself. What I mean is by the last two slides that we've talked about, we've talked about, you know, pretending that it would happen to me. Answer A would be correct. Why? Well, because if it got warm, I would believe that I got closer to the source of the heat, which again is Earth, correct? And I am indicated altitude because I'm the one in error and that's where we're looking for the error. I'm indicated altitude. If I was brought to warm air, I believe I'm closer to the surface, telling you that I would be closer to the surface, when in reality the truth is, the true altitude is that you're actually higher. B is wrong because again, if it's hotter, we should be getting closer to Earth. I would believe that I am closer to Earth. And again, C, lower temperatures would make me believe that I have gone up in the mountains. This is saying that indicated is showing lower than true. Remember, you are indicated. You're the one in error. If it's cold, I believe I'm in the mountains. Ah, there you go. Let me emphasize a little bit on the reasons why we need to pay so much attention to the question. Well, for example, the same question could be asked in a complete opposite way. Let's say if they ask you if you change your altimeter setting inside your airplane from 2992 to a setting of 3010, what would happen? Well, in this case, your altimeter will increase by 180 feet. If we hadn't done this, we would have an error of negative 180 like we saw from the last question. But in this case, the question is asking us to change the altimeter setting and read off the altimeter what's happened. Well, if you increase the pressure on the Coleman's window, the altimeter starts reading higher. Also, again, remember that you have to set the altimeter to the local altimeter setting and be within 75 feet. There's a multiple of questions that ask that, what is the acceptable error on an altimeter setting? If you don't have an altimeter setting, you're able to find the airport elevation on your approach plate, on the AFD, on the route chart, there's a bunch of ways to figure out what the altitude at your airport is, and I'm pretty sure you're familiar with all this, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Let's see if you got it. Tap on the correct answer to this question. Now let's go over the types of altitude. These are just terms that you must become familiar with, so you know the differences between them. Indicated altitude is obviously what's indicated by the instrument. So that's the altitude read directly off the face of the instrument. Your next altitude is called pressure altitude. And this is, well, if you're flying above 18,000 feet, that's what you're flying, pressure altitude. And it is also standard, let's say, if uh, at uh, sea level, the pressure today would be 2992, then pressure altitude matches indicated altitude. The two numbers would pretty much be the same. Pressure altitude is indicated altitude compared to pressure. So how do we find pressure altitude? We could either have to find at any given altitude your pressure altitude. You can set 2992 in the Coleman's window. Or to find pressure altitude, we can also use the formula by subtracting whatever we did before in the example a couple of slides ago, where we subtracted from what today's pressure is, 2992, and we would find the differential which gives you pressure altitude. Density altitude is pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature. As it gets warmer, density altitude increases. As it gets colder, density altitude decreases. So what is all the fuss about density altitude? Well, let me explain. In reality, the only important altitude is your indicated altitude. That's the only number that's really fundamental for you. What is density altitude? Where, where does density altitude come in and, and give us problems? Well, density altitude affects the performance of the airplane. Let's say that you're at sea level and you're expecting a certain amount of performance. The lower and colder you are, the better your aircraft performs because it generates more lift. The higher and warmer it is, you don't get the same performance out of your airplane. It just doesn't go as well. It doesn't climb as well. It doesn't get as fast. So what is density altitude? Well, 
Density altitude is a number that will just affect performance of your airplane. Whether you're at zero feet or 10,000 feet, those are just your indicated altitude. The airplane, although you take off from zero feet, it's very, very warm and the pressure is incredibly low. Your airplane will perform like if it was at 10,000 feet. So if you look at your performance charts, 10,000 feet, I exaggerate a little bit because the pressure would be so low that you're probably in a hurricane. So taking off would not be a good idea if you know what I mean. But still, just as an extreme for the example, if the pressure was so low and the temperature so hot, your airplane is just not performing well. So when you're looking at the performance charts and you're thinking, okay, can I clear that obstacle? That's where density altitude comes in effect. That's it. Absolute altitude is the height above the ground of your airplane, and true altitude is the altitude above sea level. Vertical speed indicator. The VSI works very similarly to the altimeter, but it has two connections to the static port instead of just one. And this is because the VSI needs to calculate the difference between the pressure that was and the pressure that is. In simple words, what it does is the instrument itself is connected through a large opening to the static port and this large opening pretty much is instantly equal to what the outside pressure is and then it is connected also to a calibrated leak which is a small opening in the back. The small opening in the back is called a calibrated leak because it leaks pressure in and out, it equalizes pressure always at a given amount. By having this always at a given amount, as the pressure changes from you climbing or descending, the instrument itself is going to be exactly at the outside pressure, while the calibrated leak is slowly leaking into the inside of the instrument a pressure at a given amount. So for example, under standard conditions, if you initiate a climb uh, from 1,000 feet to 2,000 feet, as we go from 1,500 feet, one side of the VSI will have a pressure of 2842, which in this case is going to be low because the outside of the instrument where the calibrated leak pressure is coming in, well, there we have a little bit of a different pressure. Who knows, maybe 29? Uh, somewhere around there, but it will be a higher pressure because it leaked at a slower rate than what you're actually climbing at. And this will force the instrument to show you a climb. What kind of climb depends on your, the, the rate of climb that you're using, and that's what is exactly going to be shown by reading the difference between the pressure inside those aneroid wafers and the pressure inside the little cage of the instrument. It can tell you exactly how fast you're going up or down. So first of all, let's see how the airspeed indicator works from the inside out and name its parts. Starting from the outside, the airspeed indicator is connected to the pitot tube and drain hole which feed impact air to the diaphragm and to the static port which feeds the outside pressure to the chamber of the instrument. We will see later in detail why it is important to do this. The diaphragm, in turn, is connected through levers to the sector which is connected to the hand taft pinion. And now that we've seen how the altimeter is built, let's see how it actually works. The altimeter is probably at first glance the simplest instrument on the airplane, except maybe for the compass. As you fly through the air faster and faster, as shown by the animation, the air striking the pitot tube enters more rapidly, and this expands the diaphragm further and further. The diaphragm is connected to the sector for levers, which rotate it, and in turn, this rotates the hand taft pinion that is directly connected to the speed dial and displays the current speed. So if everything is working properly, the airspeed indicator will always, most likely, read accurately. But what happens if its connections to the outside world become occluded? For that, let's take a peek at the next couple of slides. Now, the airspeed indicator is affected only by changes in temperature and not in pressure. We will see why pressure doesn't affect it on the next slide. As you probably know, colder air is much denser. And as you can see from the animation, as you fly into colder air, the denser air exerts a bigger force on the diaphragm and therefore expands it more. This obviously affects the reading on the dial. 
The colder the air is, the higher the indicated airspeed, while your real speed, your true airspeed, is actually lower. Vice versa, the warmer the air is, the lower the indicated airspeed reads, while your true airspeed is actually higher. On the other hand, pressure changes do not affect the airspeed indicator at all, as long as everything is working properly. The reason is that the chamber of the airspeed indicator is connected to the static port, and this means that as we fly along, as shown by the animation, from, in this case, low pressure to high pressure, the pressure differential between the diaphragm and the airspeed chamber stays the same, and the diaphragm expands and contracts only a result of changes in impact air. So if the speed doesn't change, the airspeed indication remains unaltered. Next, let's look at what happens when things start to clog up. Now, let's start from the easiest and most common problem you might encounter. Say that you're flying and it starts to snow. Again, as you can see from the animation, as the snow starts to accumulate on the pitot tube, the opening starts to freeze over. As this is happening, the impact air inflating the diaphragm starts to bleed out from the drain hole and the indicated airspeed starts to drop until the impact air entrance is fully clogged, at which point the indicated airspeed will drop to zero. Keep in mind that the aneroid wafer still holds the outside pressure inside of it, but this is equal to the pressure inside the chamber of the instrument. Therefore, the reading of the airspeed indicator does drop to zero. On the next slide, you will understand better this latest pressure concept. Now, in the case of a complete blockage of the pitot tube and static port, it is pretty obvious, at least if we know how an altimeter works, to figure out what will happen. In essence, we have actually transformed the diaphragm into a aneroid wafer, and therefore transformed the airspeed indicator into an altimeter. The air and pressure inside the diaphragm is now trapped, while the pressure inside the chamber changes based on the outside pressure. So, if again we started flying from an area of low pressure into an area of high pressure, we would notice that the airspeed indicator would start to read lower, because the higher pressure in the chamber of the instrument would squeeze the diaphragm, therefore forcing the airspeed to read lower. Keep in mind that it is highly unlikely that both pitot tube and drain hole become blocked simultaneously. Your pitot tube would probably clog first, dropping the airspeed to zero, and eventually, the drain hole would also block, converting the airspeed indicator into an altimeter. But there are some test questions that present the scenario, and therefore we had to explain it. Now, if the static port became blocked, the result would be the opposite of what we saw on the last slide. If the airplane keeps flying at the same pressure, the airspeed would read perfectly. But, as we can see from the animation, if we again started to fly from an area of low pressure, to an area of high pressure, the airspeed indicator would start to read higher. Because while the pressure inside the chamber of the instrument remains unaltered, the pressure inside the diaphragm would increase. And again, because high goes to low, the diaphragm would be forced to expand, giving a higher airspeed reading. Finally, it is needless to say that if everything blocked at the same time, pitot tube, drain hole, and static port, the instrument would just freeze in its current position. On next and final slide, let's take a look at things from a mathematical point of view. Okay, another way to answer test questions is through a simple mathematical process. Let's introduce this imaginary formula. V equals D plus S minus S, where V is the velocity of the aircraft, the true airspeed. D is the dynamic or impact air. The first S is the pressure of the static air entering from the pitot tube, or the drain hole, and the second S is the static air entering from the static port. Now, let's say that you're flying at 100 knots, and the pressure is 27.92. The formula would read V equals 100 plus 27.92 minus 27.92, or V equals 100. As long as everything remains functional, the speed would always be accurate. Now let's say that the pitot tube becomes blocked. Then we have V equals 0 plus 27.92 from the drain hole minus 27.92 from the static source, or V equals 0. So as we saw on an earlier slide, if the pitot tube becomes blocked, the airspeed drops to 0. 
If the pitot tube and drain hole block, you would have V equals 100 plus 2792 fixed value, it will not change anymore, minus 2792, which varies depending on the outside pressure. If we climbed a thousand feet, the formula would be V equals 100 plus 2792 minus 26.92, or V equals 101. So, as we climb, the airspeed reads higher, and as we descend, lower. Just like an altimeter. Finally, if the static port become blocked, the formula would read V equals 100 plus 2792, this time this value is variable, minus 27.92, static. This will not change. So again, if we climbed 1,000 feet, the result would be V equals 100 plus 26.92 minus 27.92 or V equals 99. So, as we climb, the airspeed reads lower, and vice versa, as we descend, it reads higher, the opposite of an altimeter. Remember that this formula does not really exist, but if you can remember it, it may help you answer the questions on the test. Let's talk about types of airspeed. As we said before, as for altitudes, the only altitude that you really cared about was your indicated altitude and so is here. The only real airspeed that will concern you when you fly is your indicated airspeed. When a controller tells you to fly 120 knots he's looking for you to look for 120, 120 knots on your airspeed indicator and that's your indicated airspeed that's what's read directly off of your airspeed indicator. A calibrated airspeed pretty much is a number that you can find in the POH based on your angle of attack and speed. You will have more or less air impacting the pitot tube at an angle. That angle will cause an error. That error gives you your calibrated airspeed and again can be found on the POH. Equivalent airspeed is something that you're probably not going to deal with much. Equivalent airspeed is pretty much when you're flying above 200 knots, the airspeed, the, 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 the impact there that, that impacts the pitot tube gets kind of compressed. The hole, if you want, is not big enough to accommodate all that air coming in. So for this, there's another error, and that error uh, calculated will give you your equivalent airspeed. If you correct calibrated for compressibility error, you get an equivalent airspeed. Again, you would refer to your POH, but again, you will not deal with this too much because not too many training airplanes go above 200 knots, if you know what I mean. True airspeed is your equivalent airspeed corrected for temperature. Temperature, again, if the temperature is really hot, the air would be less dense. If it's less dense, it impacts on the diaphragms a lot less. And the speed that you would see would be a lot smaller if the air, if the air was really hot. And if the air was really cold, you would get the opposite effect, a very high pressure air. Now, denser air enters the, the pitot tube giving you a higher speed. If you correct for the temperature, if you correct your equivalent airspeed for the temperature, now you get your true airspeed. Ground speed is another value that you probably want to look at and if you have a GPS or you have some kind of other system that can give you ground speed which is the speed of you moving over the ground, of the airplane moving over the ground, that's you know all those, those missed approach numbers, uh, the time that you have to go missed, uh, and a lot of values are based on this airspeed and instrument. So that's another airspeed that you might be interested in looking at. And Mach number is just a relationship between your speed and the speed of sound. Now let's talk about gyroscopic systems. They're pretty fancy working. The gyroscopic instruments are generally three in your airplane. One is going to be the attitude indicator, the directional gyro or heading indicator, and the turn coordinator. We will talk about these instruments one by one in detail in the next couple of slides. In most airplanes, the heading indicator and attitude indicator are vacuum driven, and generally the turn coordinator is electrical. The first thing we need to know and understand to understand gyros is to understand their physical laws. If you spin an object fast enough, it will behave according to the two following laws. The first one says that that object will be rigid in space. Rigidity in space means that a spinning gyro never leaves its original position, even if you move its plane of rotation. So if you move the airplane around, 
the gyro stays in the position it was in the first place. So you're moving the aircraft around these gyros. Precession, on the other hand, says if you apply a force to a gyro, the gyro will respond with the same force, but as the gyro is rotating, it will rotate 90 degrees ahead and, and apply that force 90 degrees past. So let's say you're spinning a bicycle wheel and you hit the top of the wheel. You would assume that the, the wheel would wobble from top to bottom. No, nope. let's spin that wheel 90 degrees and now it's wobbling from side to side instead of top to bottom. Let's start with a heading indicator. An indicator is probably the easiest of your gyros. It works with rigidity in space. It has a vertical spinning gyro that pretty much maintains its position all the time by spinning at 18,000 RPM, which is pretty fast. That's why gyros are so delicate, is because their functionality is dependent on um, very high speeds. As you move the aircraft, the gyro stays where it was. So as you move the nose 90 degrees left, uh, you will see that the gyro has stayed in its original position, so the little airplane inside your gyro has actually moved because that's fixed to the airplane and has moved 90 degrees to the left. Precession also acts on a gyro, although to be an FAA approved gyro for instrument, that gyro should not process more than 3 degrees per 15 minutes. There is no way for us to do anything with it. The only thing you need to do is constantly realign your gyro with your compass whenever you're in uh, smooth conditions. The attitude indicator. The attitude indicator is probably the most intriguing instrument. Its operation is kind of really cool. The way it works is it uses both rigidity in space and precession. Rigidity in space keeps the horizon bar aligned to the Earth's surface. So no matter what you do, it stays aligned to the Earth's surface, giving you a reference to you banking and pitching with respect to the surface of Earth. Where precession comes in is with these little pendulous veins that are at the bottom of the gyro. Let's say that you pitch up. If you pitched up, the gyro, obviously you're applying a force to it, and that force would respond 90 degrees in the rotation of the gyro, and this gyro rotates horizontally. So if you pitched up, the gyro should show a bank. Well, the gyro actually does show a bank, but it's an instantaneous fixing. What it does is, by disaligning itself with the Earth's surface, as you see, now we have gravity pulling on those pendulous veins, on those little doors. These little doors will open or close holes that will throw air out of them. And by doing this, again, they will apply a force, which is applied 90 degrees ahead of it again, and counteracts the initial force. So you pitch up. The instrument wants to bank, but one of the one of the doors is going to be open because of gravity, applying an opposite force and realigning the instrument to the horizon. It's pretty cool. So let's take a better peek at it and see exactly how it works. The attitude indicator spins at an incredible rate of more than 18,000 rounds per minute. This is accomplished by the vacuum pump that pushes high pressure air through the instrument. The primary purpose of this air is to help spin the gyro, but the secondary and hidden purpose of this air is to help the instrument fight precession. As you probably know, precession is a gyroscopic physical law that says that if you apply a force to a gyro, the gyro will respond with the same force but 90 degrees ahead in the sense of rotation of the gyro. So for example, if we have a spinning bicycle wheel, and then we decide to hit the top of the wheel, the wheel will wobble sideways as shown, rather than vertically where we actually applied the force. This is because that force moved 90 degrees in the sense of rotation of that wheel, and then was applied. The attitude indicator works with rigidity in space. In other words, the artificial horizon never moves from its original position. It's the airplane that moves around it, as you can see from the animation. You do not notice this on the airplane because your body is moving with the airplane and it looks like the horizon is spinning, but that is obviously not the case. The attitude indicator also has to follow the precession law of gyros. And it actually does, but it fixes itself faster than you can notice by the use of the most basic law in the universe, the law of gravity. If no force is applied to the gyro, 
The air that spins it exits from the bottom of the instrument through four little holes that are semi-closed by doors called pendulous veins. These doors are free to swing and they do so using the force of gravity. What happens in the attitude indicator is the same as the bicycle wheel we saw earlier. Every time a force is applied to the airplane, the gyro responds with the same force 90 degrees ahead in the same sense of its rotation. So let's say that we pitch the airplane up. This will exert a force on the gyro as shown and that force will move 90 degrees in the sense of the gyro's rotation, in this case counterclockwise, and force the attitude indicator to show a bank. But as the gyro bends, gravity will make the front spinning door open completely and the back door close completely. So the gyro has now a new force applied to it, which also moves 90 degrees counterclockwise and forces the gyro to realign itself with the Earth's surface. Well, let's talk about errors that an attitude indicator might have. The attitude indicator is built really well, so errors are very limited. But there are some errors, and they're all due to precession. The little doors of the pendulous veins have to react to, to forces and gravity, and it takes a little bit of time sometimes to react to these forces. The biggest one is when you level out of a 180 degree turn, because the gyro is furthest away from its original position. If you understand what I mean, if you turn 270 degrees, you're really only 90 degrees away from its original position. Let's say if you turn from north to west, to turning to the right, you've turned 270 degrees, which is a big turn, but you're only 90 degrees away from north. If you wanted to go back to north, you only had to go 90 degrees. If you go to 180 degrees from north, that's the furthest away from north possible, and that's what causes the biggest error. The gyro may also tumble if you bank more than 80 degrees or pitch more than 60, and when level enough out of a turn, it might actually show you a turn in the opposite direction. These are all test questions, so remember this. And now the turn coordinator. The turn coordinator is your gyro that's usually driven electrically. An electrical motor drives uh, the turn coordinator. Quality of the turn is provided uh, by the ball and quantity is provided by the needle or the, the airplane and most newer turn coordinators. It's a uh, gyro that spins vertically and it's canted at an angle and uh, w works by reacting with precession to yawing forces. There are three possible things that you could be doing in a turn. The first would be a coordinated turn. In a coordinated turn you would have uh, the ball centered and that means that centrifugal force and uh, centripetal force and horizontal component of lift are equal. This means that you're actually turning at a rate. In this case here, you're doing a half standard rate turn, but in general, unless you're doing a, a radar approach, you will be using standard rate turn, and a standard rate turn means that it will take you two minutes to do a 360 degree turn. A lot of questions on the test will ask about, you know, if you're going to do a 180 degree turn using a standard uh, rate turn, and that's where you have to pay attention again. Remember my my emphasis on paying attention to the question. A lot of people fail these answers because what they do is they just say, oh, yep, standard rate turn. No, wait, look at the question. The question said, how long will it take you to do a 180 degree turn at a half standard rate turn. Pay attention to what they're asking you. That's two minutes. At a standard rate turn, it would take half of that, one minute. But because they're asking you half a standard rate turn, okay? So again, just pay attention to the question. Make sure you understand what they're asking you. From there, the math is simple. Two minutes for a standard rate turn, uh, 360 degrees, one minute for half of that. And you know, you're turning pretty much three degrees per second. So if they asked you how long would uh, 30 degrees take, that's 10 seconds. A skidding turn is, think of your car, to remember this easy, which one is the skid, which one is the slip. We don't talk about slipping on your car, but you do talk about skid marks, right? What would leave a skid mark? Well, let's say you're making a left turn, but the car is going to the right. Let's say, for example, there's snow on the ground and you make a left turn, but the car starts skidding in the opposite direction of your turn. So that would be figure one. A skid 
is when you're trying to turn in one direction but the object or the airplane in this case is actually being pulled outside the turn so again remember your car you skid when you turn left on the snow and your car just skids to the right a slip is the opposite you are turning to the left and you're actually being pulled in more than what you wanted to turn so you're trying to make a small turn but the airplane is actually turning a lot faster because your centripetal force is a lot greater let's go over a couple of trick questions that come uh, when talking about the turn coordinator one of them for example may ask you what does the turn coordinator directly display remember you need to understand what the question is asking you directly what do you get directly from a turn coordinator directly you only get the quality and quantity of the turn the two wrong answers will say angle of bank it is true you can actually determine the angle of bank by looking at a heading indicator and looking at your indicated airspeed and then again going down and doing a formula which is indicated airspeed divided by 10 and adding 5 to that number so if you find it 100 knots and you're doing a standard rate turn you would have a 15 degree bank angle but do we again want to reuse all this math while flying on an airplane? I don't think so and is that direct? No you had to think, you had to multiply, you had to divide, you had to do mathematical calculations. So that's not a direct display of information now, is it? Okay? As we said, no math while flying an IFR. You'll see that again and again in this in this course. You want to keep things as simple as possible while flying an IFR. Why? Because the most accidents are caused by people falling behind the airplane. How do you start falling behind the airplane? Well, doing a math in an airplane is probably one of the simplest ways to start falling behind. Okay? Also, it is pretty obvious as we talked before with a skid, right? You know, the, the faster you turn, you're flying and uh, the, the, the greater the amount of turn that is required okay for example uh, and you can de determine it from the formula before too that it's because it's directly correlated to your airspeed if you increase your speed in a turn you will be decreasing your rate of turn again just by the formula before you see that if you increase the airspeed you'll need a, a, a bigger rate of turn and the second important thing is the obvious, the given amount, is the fact that the faster you go and the larger the radius of the turn will be. Well, just think about being again in a car and trying to take a tight turn at 100 miles an hour. I'm, I'm hoping there's a hospital nearby because <laughs> I don't foresee you having a bright future. So if you increase the speed in a turn, the radius of the turn has to increase it will increase your radius of turn and you also lose rate of turn so the faster you go the more you need to bank to maintain a standard rate turn the infamous compass why infamous well the compass is probably the most useless instrument that you can think of using while flying in in actual conditions because the compass is only precise when you're in straight and level and unaccelerated flight. As you can imagine, if you're flying in most types of clouds, we'll discuss weather and uh, weather conditions in the next chapter, but most kinds of clouds offer some kind of turbulence and uh, winds and other meteorological conditions that will change the attitude of your airplane, making the airplane straight and level very little of the time. It is the only way that you can realign your heading indicator, which is the instrument that you should be focusing on to figure out your direction of flight. But the heading indicator, as we talked before, does, although little, it does process. And the only way to adjust this procession is by looking at your compass. But again, you need to be straight and level and unaccelerated. Okay. As a matter of fact, in my opinion, you know, there's a part of the test of the flying test where you have to do compass turns do you have to do compass turns not really no as long as you do a standard rate turn you don't really ever need to use the compass except to figure out your initial position let's say that uh, you're in a heading of 360 and the examiner will ask you to turn left to a heading of 270 or just tell you to turn to 270 
Okay, 270. If I do a standard rate turn, isn't that 30 seconds? Okay, so let me initiate a turn to the left, do it a standard rate turn, count 30 seconds, and level out. You can use a timer for those 30 seconds, or if the examiner said, no, 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 wait, you need, you need to use your compass. Okay, can you count to 30? <laughs> Also, the compass has an, a number of additional problems, such as deviation, variation, magnetic dip, and we'll discuss all of these in the next couple of slides. Okay, let's face these errors that uh, are present when you're using a compass. First is deviation. It's pretty simple. Any magnetic field is subject to variation from uh, electrical forces. If you put electrical forces close to a magnet, you will excite that magnet and have the magnet deviate towards that, uh, that force. So obviously in your instrument you do have electrical equipment. A lot of your instruments uh, use electricity to, to, to fly. As a matter of fact, they remember that you needed a generator for the grab car D, that acronym of the instruments that you actually needed to fly. You needed a generator to generate electricity for your instruments. So obviously you do have electrical equipment in your airplane. It's kind of obvious, but because of this, the, the compass actually, when it might be showing north, but when it's showing north, you're actually at 0 0.01, you know, you, you have more two or three degrees to the right. This is easily corrected by just having a compass card inside your airplane, pretty much next to the instrument itself, underneath it usually. There's a little compass card. That compass card shows for north, steer 002. Okay, so if you actually wanted to fly north precise, you would have to look at the compass and put 002. This is obviously negligible because, it, as we said before, the compass is already bad enough to use as is, and to actually be able to fly 002 on a compass might be a little bit complicated, unless you have some kind of digital compass that displays the number. Variation is the angular difference between magnetic north and true north. We would like to have north at the middle of the North Pole, south at the middle of the South Pole, but that's not how north and south work. North and south keep moving for the years. They move from east to west, and also every 750,000 years switch completely, where what we call north today is going to be south, and what we call south is going to be north. Not that it will matter too much, there's a lot of years that go by before this change happens. But just keep in mind that north and south are not two fixed positions, they actually move. This can make it quite nasty for people trying to go places. Today you wanted to go uh, to Europe and you put a certain heading, and a hundred years from now, that heading will bring you to Africa. So, <laughs> obviously, this could be a problem. So, what did we come up with? We came up with a system that just gives us a true north and a true south, a position relative to cartography that will keep north and south where it is. And to do this, the only thing we need to do is use a little formula, a little system, which is called east is least and west is best. If you wanted to fly, let's say, west, but on your chart you see a variation of 4 east. Well, you have to subtract 4 from 270, giving you a heading of 266. Okay, so just remember. Also, this is just for your test. East is least and west is best. Add west, subtract these, just for the test. It has no use in flying, because when you're flying IFR, you're using instrument and route charts and instrument approach plates which display the magnetic number not the true number so if you fly those numbers you will be accurate and land on the runway and not in Africa now let's talk about magnetic dip magnetic dip is pretty much a difference between the alignment of the magnetic forces and earth at the equator there is no error out of magnetic dip because the magnetic forces are parallel to the Earth's surface. But as you see from the picture, the more you head towards the north or the south, and the more the force is aiming downwards rather than parallel to the Earth's surface. This is called magnetic dip. Because of this problem, we have two errors associated with a compass and we'll have a couple of acronyms for these errors which are called UNOS and ANS. What this means is as you turn towards the south the compass will turn faster than the airplane itself 
and vice versa if you turn towards the north the compass moves slower so what you do is while turning towards the north you will undershoot let's say you're turning from east to north in the New York area that would be about a 30 degree undershoot as you turn towards the south you would turn more you would turn past south so you would turn for example again from turning to east to south you would be stopping at 210 instead of south if you're in the New York area so again remember undershoot north overshoot south the second error is while on a heading of east or west you have acceleration and deceleration error and that's when your ands come in if you accelerate the compass will show a turn towards the north if you decelerate it will show a turn towards the south if you're in a south or north heading compass errors for uh, acceleration or deceleration do not exist if you're turning towards the north or south that's where your undershoot and overshoot kick in remote indicating compass RMIs were developed to help compensate for errors and limitations of older compasses and they're pretty much an electronic compass the unit is somewhere in the airplane usually located in the wing and uh, the magnetic unit which sends the information to your free gyro it can be free gyro or slave gyro if it's slave it's slave to the compass if you want it to let's say you, there's an error your compass is showing for example that this is on north and as you see this one is showing about a 339 heading uh, you can unslave the gyro and then rotate the RMI until it hits north and then you could reslave it again there are a couple of tricky questions on this and we'll cover it in the next slide okay so as we said let's present a tricky question and see how we solve it let's say the question asks refer to figure 143 the heading on a remote indicating compass is 20 degrees to the left of that desired what action is required to move the desired heading under the heading reference simple steps as usual first thing we need to do is to draw out a heading indicator it doesn't matter what heading you put me for example I put 270 as a heading on this one on this example here and uh, now I have to identify the correct heading the heading that would actually be the correct one which is 20 degrees to the right of 270 because the heading on the indicated comp on the indicated is 20 degrees to the left of the desired so obviously west has to be 20 degrees left of my desired heading which in this case again it would be 290 at this point now we want 290 to be on top where west is so how do we do that well let's draw a line that brings uh, 290 to the top and as you see there's that little line that is a counterclockwise line that will bring 290 to the top of my instrument finally if we just match the line to figure 143 it is easy to see that that line there matches my counterclockwise adjustment button so the way you would do this is you would press the slave uh, so to unslave your uh, remote indicated compass and twist the counterclockwise button until 290 is on top flying an airplane whether by visual or instrument references consists of four fundamental maneuver straight and level turns climbs and descents attitude instrument flying consists of three steps and they are going in this order which is also a test question first of all cross-checking the instruments it is fundamental that you cross-check the instruments because as we said before these instruments can fail if you keep cross-checking the instruments you're making sure that all the instruments are giving you pertinent and equal information now that we have cross-checked the instruments we actually have to interpret what the instrument is saying so let's say that we're assigned 4500 feet and as you can see from the altimeter we're at 4900 feet the controller is going to start yelling at us pretty soon first we cross check the altimeter and maybe the VSI to see if yep, we were climbing and the attitude indicator also shows me that I'm climbing second we interpreted information we looked okay so we're 400 feet above the altitude that we desire so I'm gonna do my third step which is control input 
pitch down so I can go back to 2,000 feet. So again, the correct sequence is cross-check, interpret, and control input. As usual, the FAA will do their best to figure out a way to trick you into answering the question in a wrong way. Let's give you an example. What instrument is considered primary for pitch while performing an accelerating standard rate turn to the left? You see, what they do is they try to throw you off. What they're doing is they're giving you a bunch of information. Performing an accelerating standard rate turn to the left, but what are they asking you? They asking, they're asking for pitch. What is the primary for pitch? So again, you know, there, it, all these tricks in there to try to veer you away from what they're really asking you, that's when, again, you need to pay attention to the question. You're asked pitch, so you're not going to change your altitude. Remember that in IFR, there are three basic things that you need to be doing. You need to be going in a certain direction, which is assigned by ATC. You need to be holding a certain altitude, again, assigned by ATC and you're assigned also a speed. You shall maintain your altitude within 100 feet, your speed within 10 knots, and you're heading within 10 degrees. So 90% of the time when you're flying an IFR, your primary instruments, it's not primary because it's the most important, it's not primary because it's uh, the most beneficial, no, it's primary because it's the only instrument that can give you that information. In this case, again, we are not changing our altitude. We are assigned, let's say, 3,000 feet, and now we're going to perform an accelerating standard rate turn. But what is primary for pitch? Your altimeter is primary for pitch. Controlling the airplane can be best done by using the primary supporting method. Let's shed some light on this primary supporting stuff. What is a primary instrument? A primary instrument is that instrument that if you knew it was operating correctly, it was not broken, you know for sure that it is operating, pretty much that would be the only instrument that you need to look at for that type of information. Let's say, for example, your altitude. Okay, If you're maintaining 3,000 feet, you're required to maintain 3,000 feet. If you knew for sure that the altimeter was working 100%, then you would just have to look at the altimeter. You wouldn't have to cross-check the other instruments to make sure that you are at 3,000 feet. Problem is, instruments do break, blockages do happen, and static ports and whatnot. So you can't rely only on one instrument. You're still focusing most of your attention to maintain your altitude on the altimeter but you're going to have to double check and for example now you see your VSI going down, airspeed increasing the numbers, attitude indicator also showing a descent well then you are probably into the situation where your altimeter is not working properly anymore so that's when uh oh I need to use my supporting instruments now something else is going to have to become primary which at this point is probably going to be your attitude indicator instruments are grouped as they relate to control functions and aircraft performance as follows. You have pitch instruments, these are your attitude indicator, your altimeter, your airspeed indicator, and your vertical speed indicator. You have bank instruments, attitude indicator, heading indicator, magnetic compass, and turn coordinator. And then you have your power instruments, which is your airspeed indicator and your, your engi engine instruments, manifold pressure gauge, tachometer, etc. Most of the questions on this paragraph are going to be asking about primary and supporting. What you need to understand is that you really need to have down the difference between what is a primary instrument and what is a supporting instrument. Keep in mind that you're flying under instrument conditions and because of that you have to follow the instructions given to you by ATC. There's a lot of traffic around you so you need to pay attention. Because you cannot see them being that you're inside the clouds you must rely on the instructions from ATC and as I said before when they give you instructions you need to maintain altitude within 100 feet, you need to maintain heading within 10 degrees and airspeed within 10 knots. So when you're flying straight and level it's pretty obvious that the instrument for pitch okay what am I assigned? 3,000 feet. What is the only instrument that will tell me whether I am at 3,000 feet or not? You guessed it. Altimeter. For bank 
Well, you're assigned the heading, right? You've got to maintain that within 10 degrees. What is the only instrument that will give you that number? Your heading indicator. For power, you're assigned a near speed. You've got to maintain that within 10 knots. What is the only instrument, again, that will let you know whether you are at that airspeed? You guessed it, airspeed indicator. Again, as usual, we're going to find simple solutions to these questions that the FAA asks you. Whenever you're asked a question about primary supporting, you have to first identify what are they asking you for. Is it the pitch? Is it the bank? Is it the power? Second, are they asking me for what's my primary or what is my supporting? So again, go in the question and find out what is the primary instrument. Okay, they're asking me for primary. Third, does the value need to change or does the value not change? So if they're asking you what is the primary instrument for pitch during uh, turn to the right, uh, primary for pitch and returning. So we're not, but we're, we're asking for the pitch. The value is not changing. Okay. If you don't need to change the value, then you revert back to your three most important instruments that we discussed above: your altimeter, your airspeed indicator, and heading indicator. If you are changing it, you must be changing it according to a specific instructions. Let's say, for example, the controller has asked you to change your heading from 180 to 090. What would be the primary instrument for bank? So what are they asking me here? They are asking me, first of all, bank. We are, we're, we're asking for bank. We're asking for the primary instrument. And third, we are changing the value. Okay? The answer is, when you're turning an IFR, when you perform your maneuvers in IFR, you're supposed to do them according to certain methods. As you know, for turning, you're supposed to turn it at a standard rate. What is the only instrument that will tell you whether you're performing a standard rate turn or not? You guessed it again, <laughs> the turn coordinator. Most people believe that the attitude indicator should be the primary. And the reason for most people trying to pick the attitude indicator for primary is because when you are switching from you know what you were doing in private, looking outside, to now having to look inside, well the the the, the, the closest thing you can get to what you had before your horizon is your attitude indicator. But the attitude indicator has no precision whatsoever. It, it, it is, I mean, we saw a pretty nice instrument, a pretty, pretty awesome instrument, the way it works. But does it give you numerical values? None, except for when you're banking. If you want to bank at a 30 degree bank or pitch at 10 degrees, okay. But it does not allow you for numerical values. So if you just use the attitude indicator, sooner or later, you'll probably smack into a mountain because you're maybe you're pitching down two degrees but you can't really notice that you're pitching down two degrees if you don't look at your altimeter you're going to keep losing altitude until oops the other instruments give you numerical values the numerical values that we said are so important because ATC is expecting you to perform within those numerical values the attitude indicator becomes your number one friend when you are in a level five thunderstorm because the only thing you can care about is trying to keep your wings level and during transitions if the question asked during a transition from straight and level to a climb what is the primary instrument for pitch because the attitude indicator gives you both pitch and bank information it is your best instrument during a transition because we're kind we're human so we do one thing right and we mess up another so if you use the attitude indicator you can see that you pitch up and I'm not banking I'm keeping my my wings level okay so for a transition your attitude indicator is your primary in any other case the attitude indicator will never be primary unusual attitudes uh, unusual attitudes are a very effective way to determine whether you do understand your instruments and instrument flying because your brain will have to focus and scan the instruments in the cockpit determining the attitude of the airplane 
and uh, whether you're able to bring that airplane back to straight and level. Let's talk about the questions on the test that deal with this. There are two types of different questions. The first type assumes that all your instruments are working properly and will ask you, for example, like this one, refer to figure 147, how would you recover from this unusual attitude? As you see, the question does not say there's any system failure or instrument failure. In this case, we take a peek at this panel. Okay, We can see that we're turning, we can see that we're losing airspeed and climbing. So the first thing in general for most of these answers is for you to either reduce or add power. In this case here, you want to add power. Why power first? Well, because if you think about it, you know, all, all your surfaces are generating lift. For you to change the attitude of the airplane, you need to change lift on these surfaces. And the best way to affect lift is by changing the speed. By just adding airflow from your propeller over the wing area, you'll be adding uh, good uh, lift to these surfaces, giving them more power. And second, you're getting close to a stall here. If you stall, your surfaces do not work at all. So now you've got a real serious problem. So power first, then you would pitch down and level the wings. So we're going to add power, pitch down, and level the wings. That can be done simultaneously. If the situation was the opposite, uh, as we can see here from figure 145, where actually our speed is going way high, we're pitching down and banking, the situation here calls for again a reduction in power look we're close to VNE do we wanna test that and see if uh, VNE is actually VNE <laughs> probably not a good idea so reducing power right off the bat second because of the airspeed being so fast if you pull up right now you might exceed the G limitation the load limitation on your airplane again that's not something that I would consider a safe practice. So the first thing, we reduce the power. The second thing, we level the wings. Once the wings are level, we can pitch back up for straight and level flight. The second set of questions assumes some kind of failure. For example, in this case, refer to figure 146, identify the system that has failed and determine a corrective action to return the airplane to straight and level. Again, now we're going to need to look at the instruments, but we're also looking for the faulty one, the one that's not functioning properly, so we can eliminate it. What we look at is uh, I look at the airspeed indicator, and I'm looking at, uh, wow, if I look at the VSI, the airspeed indicator, the attitude indicator, uh, and, and as I said, the airspeed indicator, we're either flying an F-16 or something is wrong here because we're increasing, we're already above 200 knots, we're increasing in speed while climbing. Hmm, again, this does not look like a cockpit of an F-16 if you ask me. So probably we have a malfunction in the pedostatic system. The airspeed indicator has broken down. A lot of people get tricked because they look at the attitude indicator and say, well, that's a right turn. Turn coordinator confirms that's a right turn, but the heading indicator is moving to the left. Okay, here's a little trick. If you turn right, your heading indicator will increase in numbers. If you turn to the left, it will decrease in number. Meaning, if I turn right, 240 will go to 270. It's increasing in numbers. If I turn to the left, pretty much 240 will become 210. It decreases in numbers. In this case here, this is telling me that this will be increasing in numbers, isn't it? Because it's the card inside. It's not the instrument that spins. The card inside is spinning. And that spinning motion would bring 300 to the top, north to the top. So don't get tricked by that. You always have to look at that last. Okay, so not to get confused. Like we did before when we corrected the RMI and we used that arrow that brought to the front, this is pretty much the same system. So we identified that the airspeed indicator has malfunctioned. So at this point, we will increase power, 
and decrease pitch and bank to bring the attitude back to straight and level. Okay, so the corrective action is, as usual, power first, pitch down, and level the wings.